Okay, so it's 1.30 p.m., so let's get started. Uh, this is tutorial B for the East Asian School of Information Theory, and my name is Hyewon Chung. I'm from KAIST, and I'm the session chair uh, for this tutorial. Uh, so it's my great uh, pleasure to introduce Professor Vincent, Chen, Vincent Tan. Uh, so Vincent Tan uh, is the Dean's Chair Associate Professor at the Department of ECE and Department of Mathematics at the National University of Singapore. And he earned uh, his PhD degree in 2011 from MIT, and he's uh, awarded with the Jean Alcong Outstanding uh, WE Thesis Prize when he graduated. And he published more than 100 journal articles uh, in several areas, including information theory, machine learning, statistical signal processing, as well as optimization. And uh, he's awarded with several research and teaching awards, inclu including the uh, NUS Young Researcher Award and Distinguished Lecturer of the Information Theory Society. And he's now serving as the elected member of IEEE Information Theory Society Board of Governors and also the Associate Editor for the Transaction Information Theory and Transaction Signal Processing. Okay, so uh, let's welcome Professor Vincent Tan. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. So thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, thank you very much for the organizers for having me. So it's a great pleasure to talk about information theory. Unfortunately, we cannot meet in person. Otherwise, I would like a lot of uh, soju in uh, Korea. Every time I go there, I get very drunk. But I have very good uh, hosts in uh, Korea. So today, I want to talk to you about... Uh, what is chang -Hoo saying? Okay. <laughs> so every time uh, I go to Korea, I enjoy myself very much. So unfortunately, we cannot go. But nevertheless, let me take this opportunity to talk to you about some uh, work that we have done in the past four or five years that is going to be consolidated into a monograph. So this work is uh, concerning traditional aspects of information theory together with contemporary aspects of the same theory, okay? So as I mentioned, this is going to be based on an upcoming monograph by a former postdoc, Lee Yu and myself. Uh, we, in this tutorial, will cover classical stuff and more recent advances based on my knowledge and my preferences. So we will unfortunately not be able to touch all bases. All right? In our monograph, we touch more bases than I do here. Uh, everything, for example, everything I talk about discrete is going to be discrete. You know, as, as high one knows, I'm a discrete and method of types person. So we will do some proof sketches since this is a tutorial. And so at some point in the tutorial, this may get a little bit technical. And so uh, I'm not going to apologize for that because this is called a tutorial and not called a, I don't know, presentation of my research. We are going to do some proof sketches. Okay. So however, having said that, we are going to provide as much intuition as possible about the results. All right. So you may wonder what level of information theory or probability you need to know, all right? So the answer is not too much. You need to have taken a first course in information theory at this level, Cobalt and Thomas. So the slides I've made available to everyone. So in case you want more information, we have a half completed monograph and you are free to email me at uh, vtan at nus.edu.sg if you promise to keep the monograph, uh, do not, do not uh, circulate it. I'm happy to share it with you. All right. So this is uh, what I'm going to talk about. First and foremost, we are going to talk about some natural measures of information between two random variables. Okay. So today we only talk about two random variables. Very simple, right? Then we will talk about, we will go into the 1970s and we will talk about Weiner's common information. All right. This was developed in 1975. Now we will then fast forward many years, more than 30, 35 years, to talk about uh, new material that uh, myself and uh, Lei Yu extended from Weiner. So this is uh, developed in the 2017 onwards. All right, that was uh, our contribution. Now, this is actually encompassing all these three topics on uh, channel synthesis, as well as exact common information and the uh, really common information. Then we will go to a somewhat unconventional topic, which seems like it's a numerical linear algebra new linear algebra. It seems that it's got nothing to do with probability or information theory, but we will see that there are intimate connections to Weiner's common information. Now, 
Then we will talk about another notion of minus common info, another notion of common information known as the GKW or Gux Kernel Witzenhausen's common information. And we will see that this is connected to the non-interactive correlation distillation problem. Once we talk about this, we will be talking about very exciting conjectures that we have been managed, that we have managed to resolve in some way or another. So here, somewhere here, we will resolve one conjecture and somewhere here, we will resolve two conjectures. And all of these things will be tied together using a common framework known as common information. By the way, uh, I know that there are three uh, segments to this tutorial, right? For the first segment, when should I stop, Haiwan? Uh, I had 2.20, please. 2.20, oh, so that's 1.20. Okay, no problem. We can stop or start anytime. So we want to talk about Weiner's common information. So before that, I want to talk about uh, some natural notions of information between two random variables. Okay, let's just look at all these. Now, given two random variables, X and Y, with joint distribution pi X, Y, we will call this a target distribution. Target, all right? This seems to be too thick. So we want to know how common they are. So one may no conceive of the usual notion of the correlation coefficient, which is between minus one and one. If this takes on the extremal value plus one, then the two random variables are perfectly correlated. Okay, and if it takes on the value minus one, they are perfectly negatively correlated if you wish. And if it takes on the value zero, then they are uncorrelated, all right? So we as information theorists also love our information measures such as mutual information, which is the relative entropy between the product and the joint and the product, basically the, the relative entropy of the joint and the product of the marginals. But as we as information theorists, as particularly myself, we love operational interpretations. What does that mean? We want to tell a story and at the end of the day, associate an information functional to the answer of that particular story. For example, the minimum rate of compression for source coding is entropy. Entropy does not come about because it looks nice. It comes about because it's the answer to a very interesting compression problem. All right. So as so Weiner's common information and GKW common information are two of the archetypal notions of ran, common information among random variables that admit operational interpretations. And we will discuss this in detail. So first and foremost, let us get started on Weiner's common information. What is it? What is the story? Well, we have a common source of randomness M. This is a uniform random variable on the support two to the NR, okay? And a code consists of two things. These two things are called stochastic encoders. All right, there's a name to it, stochastic encoders. And these two stochastic encoders generate two random vectors, X, N, Y, N, such that the joint distribution is given by this. So what is this? This is the average, nothing but the average over the outputs of the joint distribution when we average over the random, uniform random input M, okay? So we have this uh, P of X, N, Y, N that is generated. And what do we hope for? We hope that the P of X, N, Y, N, the synthesized distribution is in some way close to the target distribution. Now, for us to say that they are close, they, may, they must be on the same uh, space, all right? So we need to raise the target distribution to the end for product distribution and power, if you wish. Okay, so this is the desideratum. That's the, what we want, all right? We want this, but then we need to quantify what we mean by approximation here. So Weiner was the first to study this problem uh, in this particular paper. And he really wanted to quantify the similarity between the synthesized and the target distribution in terms of the normalized relative entropy. So this is the problem he studied. What is the minimum rate of common randomness such that we can drive the normalized relative entropy to zero? Now, notice from the previous uh, picture here that the more rate I have, the easier this is. So the pertinent question here is, what is the minimum rate for us to do the job, okay? So the minimum rate is defined as the infimum of all rates such that we can do the job. Then do the job means that we can drive the normalized relative entropy to zero. So the answer turns out to be the minimization of a certain mutual information. Over what? Over a certain Markov chain here. And the Markov chain is X, W, Y. Now X and Y here have to satisfy the condition that they are distributed according to pi X, Y. That is what all this stuff here means, okay? So this is what we are going to call Weiner's common information. We're going to give it a notation, CW, all right? So this is known as Weiner's common information. So Weiner said that actually a reasonable notion of common information is given by this formula, all right? 
And this is motivated by the so-called distributed source simulation problem in which we have M and we want to design two stochastic encoders that give us Px and Yn that is close to the product color distribution. Okay, so this is motivated by this problem. All right, so this is the answer. Let us see whether the answer makes intuitive sense. All right, so now let me give you three random variables that have this structure. All right, the three random variables are X, oh sorry, there are only two. As I said, there are only two random variables in our discussion. Very simple, X and Y. But these two random variables have this special structure, X to the V and Y to the V, all right? So all these three guys are independent. So you see that they share something common here, the red stuff. So it seems like, it seems like, okay? If you do not attend my tutorial, it seems like a natural notion of the common information should be the entropy of V. All right, let's see whether this formula checks out. Now, we can take W equals to V here in the minimization. Remember, we have the Markov chain. You take W equals to V, then you will satisfy this directly, and this Markov chain. But the mutual information here becomes the mutual information here because the W is V, and this is, of course, no larger than H of V, all right, because the conditional entropy is non-negative. So that's the only sort of uh, information theory you need to know. Um, maybe later on, you also need to know a little bit about the method of types. Okay, so this is uh, hopefully basic and we are very happy thus far. Okay, so now let us move forward and do the other part because we have one direction, we need the other direction to assert that this is equal to H of V. All right, so in the other part, now comes the other part where we need to show that the minimization of the mutual information is lower bounded by H of V. Now this is marginally more difficult because we are trying to minimize a minimization, but not a problem, right? Obviously, we come back to our definitions and we have the original Markov chain that is present here, okay? But we know that V is a deterministic, so we can stick the V here and we can stick the V here, all right? Because of this structure here, all right? So now you have a Markov chain. You see that you have a, this Markov chain, V, W, V, W, V. You have this Markov chain here. So by this, you know that V is a function of W, a deterministic function of W. You can write V as GW. And so you can stick the V here, all right? And you can use the definitions of X and Y, which is this triple here. Now you have got a V here and a V here, and you notice that you can recover H of V, all right? So this is lower bounded by H of V. So what we have here is that now we can minimize, this holds for all Markov chains, we can minimize the left-hand side over all possible Markov chains, and we will get the lower bound as desired. So as I said, we will do a little bit of exercises like this, and hopefully you will not be so put off, because this to me is uh, just a warm-up of your brain. After the warm-up of the brain, we can serve you more, more nice uh, food for thought, okay? So this is the sanity check, and the sanity check tells us that uh, for this uh, simple structure here, the Wynas common information reduces to H of V as uh, our intuition hopefully tells us. So I want to talk a little bit about how we can prove such things. I'll just give you an uh, intuition about what are the tools we need, all right? So let us have two random variables. As I said, we only care about two. And these two here are called U and W. And the direct part or the achievability part, you know, in information theory, we care about achievability and converse, right? Actually, when I learned information theory, I didn't know about this until sometime later. So there's, there are two parts to uh, information theory. You need to prove existence as well as impossibility or the achievability direct part or the converse part. So this is the achievability part and we need to construct a, so a code, all right? So the idea here is uh, known as soft covering, all right? Nowadays it's called soft covering. In Wynos time, it was not called anything, all right? Nowadays it's called soft covering or resolvability, okay? But soft covering basically says that if you have two random variables and, uh, and they have a certain mutual information, you pick any number that is above the mutual information, let's say R, any number that is above the mutual information. Then you can construct a sequence of code books, all right, a sequence of code books like this. And there are two to the NR code words. R is slightly larger than mutual information, such that if you synthesize this distribution, which is an average, as an average over these distributions here, then what you get here is that you can drive two things to zero, at least two things, come on, all right? The normalized relative entropy, as well as the total variation distance. Now here, uh, sorry, I forgot to define the total variation distance, so I'll do it here. 
So this is half of summation over x or p of x, q of x for the discrete case. And everything I talk about is discrete. Okay, so as long as your rate is large enough, you can construct a distribution that approximates the output statistics. That's why this is called resolvability or approximation of output statistics or soft covering. Okay, so this is uh, derived in uh, Weiner's paper, but revisited in Han Verdu's papers. Uh, these are very beautiful things that I really love. Okay, so now th there's a lot of math here and I'm not exactly a math person, but here's a picture, all right? So this is the uh, space of all sequences of UN, all right? And within this space, there's some typical set, as you know, all right? There's some typical set. And let's say this is this, this ball here is a typical set and nothing, all these things here are atypical, all right? Typical set. Then what this is saying is that, okay, if my rate is large enough, then I can find two to the nr balls here, two to the nr, m is two to the nr. I can find two to the nr, sufficiently many balls, so that, uh, so that these balls here cover most of the typical set. All right, so you have two to the nr balls here. No, notice that if you don't have enough balls, you cannot cover the big ball, all right? So what this is saying is that, okay, you have enough balls here, then you can drive the relative entropy to zero. Okay, so that's why it's called soft covering, it's like covering this space in a soft manner. All right, so once we have the soft covering lemma, we particularize it to u equals to x, x y, u equals to x, y, and we know by Markovity that we can then split this guy here into these guys here, because by Markovity, and uh, we get the I, I, w, I w u as desired, okay? So hopefully this is uh, manageable and it's not too intense because we will do more intense things in the future. All right. So this is Weiner's common information from the distributed source simulation perspective. One more time, we have the common randomness here, common source of randomness, and we are trying to design uh, these two stochastic encoders that output x n y n, all right? And the p x n y n needs to approximate pi x y n. This is the target distribution, which we want to assess the common randomness in x and y here, okay? And the system that we use to assess the operational meaning that we assign to this problem is the distributed source simulation perspective, okay? Because this is the, uh, you are trying to dis describe, uh, you're trying to find out the minimum rate in order to describe the common uh, randomness here or the common information between X and Y here. Okay, so there's yet another perspective of this that is due to uh, Weiner himself and he connected the notion of Weiner's common information that we saw to what is now known as the gray weiner lossless source coding system. Now, in uh, standard information theory, you probably learn about lossless source coding and entropy. So now you don't have so many boxes. You only have two boxes in standard information theory. But here, this is the gray weiner system in which we have five boxes, all right? So we need to talk about three rates. So the three rates can give rise to these five boxes. And in particular, we have three encoders. And as you can see here, all right, encoder F0 is very special because it somehow encodes a common part of the random variables X and Y. Now, this is the, this uh, message here encodes the private part, if you wish, of X, and this represents the private part of Y, and this represents the common part of X and Y, if you wish, all right? So now we have two decoders, phi one, phi two. So I'm influenced, my notation is always influenced by Chiza and Connor, that's how I learned, all right? Then uh, probability of error is the probability that uh, the reconstruction is not the same as the, or as the sources that you started off with. All right, so this is the probability of error and we hope to drive this to zero, okay? So the, the common information based on the gray winer system, which we denote by this, is the minimum over all common rates R0, okay? Such that there exists a sequence of gray winer codes such that the sum rate comes very close to the joint entropy, right? This is very obscure if you see it for the first time. But let me tell you what's happening here. Now, if all these encoders were combined into one entity and all these decoders are combined into one entity, what is the minimum rate? Well, Shannon said that the minimum rate is H of X, Y. All right. So clearly we can do more. Right? Clearly we can do better or at least not worse. And what's happening here is that you are restricting yourself to this plane. All right. This plane where the three rates are fixed to be the fundamental limit when everything is combined. And we are asking then for the minimum common rate that encodes 
the common information between X and Y. So this quantity turns out to be surprisingly similar, exactly the same as Weiner's common information from the distributed source simulation perspective. All right. So this is some technology in the 1970s. We are not going to talk too much about it. We are not going to belabor the point about gray, gray minus system. I just want to show that there's a source coding perspective. From here, you can do many other things. You can write many more papers if you wish. All right, like second order, but we have already done that. Okay. So anyway, we like examples in information theory. Okay. So the running thread, the running example that we will use is that of a doubly symmetric binary source. This is the simplest possible thing that you can think of. All right. It's basically an input, a uniform input, half, half, pass through a BSC with crossover probability P. All right, this is the simplest thing that you can think of. All right, no, so you know that uh, Weiner said that the common information is given by I of X, Y, W, uh, W is in the middle, and you have this Markov chain here. So this is X and this is Y. It will be instructive for us to draw this Markov chain, okay, in terms of the P's here. And so I draw it for you here. So the... The interpretation in terms of this Markov chain is that this BSC, which is a, the binary symmetric channel with a crossover probability P, is decomposed into two binary symmetric channels here of crossover probability A. Now, for these to be the same, right, you need that A convolve A to be equal to P. All right, and if you solve this equation, you get that A is this. Now, what is A convolve A? You have A1 minus A2, that is A convolve A. All right. Uh, you need to solve this equation here, and you, you obviously you need some quadratic formula. It's a quadratic formula here. Okay, so this P gives rise to an A in the common random variable. All right, the common random variable W. So we can then plot this as a function of A and a function of P, but let us see whether these plots make sense or whether I made a mistake in my MATLAB. All right, so when P is equal to zero, what happens? When P is equal to zero, this, this one becomes one, this becomes zero, and this becomes one, all right? So X and Y become perfectly correlated, all right? This perfect correlation. So if P is equal to zero, then this is the highest, right? So when P becomes half, so when P is equal to half, then X is independent of Y. And you don't expect that there is any common information. And that is what we observe in these endpoints here. So hopefully this is perfectly clear, all right? So what I've reviewed thus far is 1970s technology by Weiner concerning com Weiner's common information, all right? This is 1970s technology. So now, hopefully uh, you have no questions and I'm crystal clear. So, all you need to take out of this is one formula. We have minimization of I of X, Y, W. This is Weiner's common information. W is in the middle, X and Y are at the side. X and Y need to satisfy the prop property that they are equal to the target distribution. And we are assessing the common information here. Okay. So now we're going to fast forward. Fast forward this, when, when did we do this? 2017, but published in 2018, all right? So, you know, what is the motivation for doing this? We want to talk about Rini common information. I need to talk about Rini divergence to you. But I'll tell you why we did this, all right? So, as I mentioned, Weiner used the normalized relative entropy to assess the similarity between P, X, N, Y, N, and Pi, X, Y, N. All right, this is the target, and this is the synthesized. Okay, so this what is this approximation here is quantified using the normalized relative entropy. There's a normalization here. Okay, and this is exactly equal to this formula that we have seen at least five times now. Okay, so what if we don't normalize? All right, we can ask a lot of interesting questions here. What if we don't normalize? Then we will get some quantity that is in general larger than or equal to Weiner's common information. Because this criterion here without normalization is more stringent. It's more stringent. That means the rate that we need is generally larger. But is it really larger? Most of the time, this is equal. For finite alphabet case, always equal. For countable alphabet case, always equal. For uncountable alphabet case, please see our monograph. Okay, so if we don't normalize, we get equal. 
for the finite alphabet case, all right? So we have a stronger measure of dependence. So, but this is equal most of the time, as I said, right? So it's not exciting. What if we want an even stronger measure of dependence? So the problem is that we are restricted ourselves to the re relative entropy. The relative entropy, KL divergence, if you wish, is the expectation over P of log of PX, QX. So we need to somehow modify this and throw this away. Okay. So now we're going to replace this by the Rooney divergence of various orders. And the orders here are somewhat unconventional. The orders we have adopted are one plus S. So the sign of S, all right, tells us about whether we are strengthening or we are weakening, all right? So the Rooney divergence is monotonically increasing in alpha or S, okay? And, and so what happens here is that D1.5 is at least as large as D1, which is at least as large as 0 0.5. So if we take a larger number here, we are strengthening. We are making the criterion more stringent. So these are more stringent measures. And these will in general be larger for S bigger than zero to T1, which is minus common information. Recall that the really divergence when specialized to order one recovers the relative entropy. Okay, all this is very complicated if you are looking at it for the first time. So I tell you, I'll go a bit slower here. So the Rooney divergence admits this formula here. Okay, if you take S to go to zero, then D1 plus S of course goes to D1. And this is the KL divergence, all right? Now, how do you then evaluate this and show that it's, it's got something to do with locks, all right? You need to use L'Hopital's rule here and take S to go to zero. Uh, you can differentiate something here, okay? And you will recover the relative entropy. So this is the ring divergence. We will also be very interested in the infinity order ring divergence. So if you take S to be infinity here, then you get this new definition. Okay, it looks relatively simple, but it turns out to be of crucial importance to our discussion. So as I already mentioned, the Rooney divergence is monotonically non-decreasing. It is non-decreasing in the order. If I pick a larger order, the Rooney divergence can go up. Okay, it cannot go down. So what, what are the implications here? If we increase the order, then the Rooney divergence increases in general. And the minimum rate that we need for approximate reconstruction is also increased. So T1 plus T is larger than T1 plus S. In the normalized case, if T is larger than S. And similarly for the unnormalized case. Now, for if I fix an order, of course the unnormalized case is larger than the normalized case, okay? Because normalization makes the whole, whole criterion less stringent, okay? So now you may wonder at this point, are we doing math for the sake of doing math? All right, why do we care? The skeptic in you might just wonder whether we are doing math for the sake of doing math. In fact, not. So we show, we argue in the sequel, that the infinity order, uh, really common information, this is when S takes the value infinity, is equal to a very interesting quantity known as exact common information. And exact common information was introduced by Kumar Lee and El Gamal in 2014. And it is through this unexpected connection between the infinity order, really common information, and the exact common information, this T, okay, that uh, we can establish that in fact, there exists some sources such that the exact common information exceeds Wynus, okay? So before that, let us soldier on and tackle the really common information problem, okay? Then we, this gives us insight into the exact common information problem. Now there are two cases to this. I call this the weaker case in which S is negative. Now if S is negative, you can think of this as T0.5. So what is T0.5? That is the minimum rate of, minimum rate such that the Rooney divergence of order 0 0.5, perhaps normalized, goes to a zero. Okay, so that is a recollection of our definitions. Minimum rate such that instead of the relative entropy here, I take the Rooney divergence of order 0 0.5. Okay, smaller than one. So obviously in this case here, we can only go down. We can only go down. All right, we cannot go up. Because this, as I mentioned, this is equal to T1. All right, and S is negative. So what we showed long time ago, all right, 
long time ago, maybe two, three years, four years ago. Actually, this result appeared in this paper here. Okay, this result says that if the Rooney order is less than one bigger than zero, then the Rooney common information is robust to the order. All right, so if I change, I don't, if I change the order between zero and one, I still recover Weiner. Okay, so what is our stepping stone to showing this? Okay, what is our stepping stone? Our stepping stone is in fact the total variation distance. Okay, so what we showed in what we showed on route to showing this is that if you change the relative entropy criterion in the Weiner's common information problem to the total variation distance, then and you consider the limb soup, okay, the upper limit of the distance between the synthesized and the target distributions not exceeding epsilon, then no matter what epsilon you choose, the minimum rate that you need to have is Weiner's common information, okay? So basically, we are robust to epsilon, which is the approximation error. Epsilon cannot be equal to one, all right? That's the only condition. It can be zero, okay? It can be zero because of this limb soup. So a picture is as follows. So this is the total variation distance, and this is the rate r, okay? What do we expect this to be? This is the graph that we have. And what does this graph say? If you have enough rate, if you are very rich, you have a lot of rate to expand, all right? You have a lot of rate. Then there exists here, there exists a sequence of codes such that you can drive the approximation between the basically the synthesized distribution and the target distribution goes to zero, okay? In this regime here. Now, alternatively in this regime here, what happens here for all sequence of codes, no matter how smart you are, the approximation, the synthesized distribution, and the target distribution, this necessarily converges to one, okay? So this is something known as a strong converse in information theory parlance. And in fact, we can prove an exponential strong converse, which means that the, this, this convergence is, so this converges, this thing here converges to one exponentially fast, okay? So one minus this thing goes down exponentially. Uh, this is written here. Okay, so, so this is actually amenable to something called second order that I care about, but not many people care about. But here we can do second order here, right? Because if we take the rate to be exactly equal to CW of Weiner's common information plus some uh, term divided by square root N, we can assess what happens here. But uh, that we leave for a discussion for another day. Okay, so I want to talk about some elements of this proof, which I find very interesting, okay? But the achievability part is completely, uh, I wouldn't say trivial, but it's straightforward, okay? This first follows by the soft covering lemma. If your rate is large enough, as I told you before, you can drive the variational distance to zero. End of story, one line, okay? The converse, however, requires some extremely cool idea, extremely cool, by Yasutara Uhama, okay? Who proved the strong converse for weiner ziff problem. Okay, so for a long time, I was trying to prove this, but uh, Uhama proved this before me. All right, and this appeared in 2018. So we leveraged this idea to prove the strong converse and thus uh, bootstrapping Polkov's result in 2012. All right, so, so what is the idea here? All right, because we have this, all right, we only have to prove the converse. All right, we, can, we know we, have, we can already achieve by the soft covering lemma. We need to combine Uhama's idea with a Pinsker type inequality due to Igao Sasson, this guy, all right? So what does he say? Uh, he says this, but let me pass this for you, okay? So there's a Rennie divergence of a certain order between zero and one. Think of it as 0 0.5. Now I'm minimizing over all probability measures that are epsilon separated in the, in the total variation sense, okay? This is exactly equal to this. This is the binary Rennie divergence. That is the Rennie divergence between two Bernoulli distributions with this and this, okay? So what it's saying is that, okay, you can have very fancy measures, all right? Very fancy measures. I don't care how on what abstract probability space you care about. But if you care about minimizing the Rennie divergence 
over these two probability measures on some abstract space, but the measures are epsilon separated. This is essentially the same as just reducing them to Bernoulli distributions. Okay. Now, the Bernoulli distributions, the ring divergence between these two Bernoulli distributions can be further simplified into this simple form here, where the epsilon shows up here. That is a total variation distance. Now, you know what is the pin skirt inequality? This is something that we study in information theory. This is lower bounded by, depending on what base you use, uh, some constant, the L1 norm between this and that. Okay, this is the pin skirt inequality. So it relates to the relative entropy to the L1 norm or the total variation distance. The L1 norm is here, but now we change this to the Rennie divergence and we have this lower bound here, okay? This turns out to be of the correct form for us. So we are saved by Sasson, all right? So stringing the two inequalities together, we get this lower bound on the Rennie divergence for any two abstract probability measures because we can reduce that to the binary case, okay? Now, however, Uhama tells us that the exponential strong converts to the total variation common information problem. We had to do a lot of work to get here, but essentially we use Uhama's technique. We have an exponential strong converse, which means that we have this uh, exponential behavior here. So stringing these two together, we plug this as epsilon into here. Okay. So beautifully, we get n epsilon out here and we normalize both sides by one over n and serendipitously, this n and this n cancel, but this e here is positive, which means that this guy here, you take limp inf here, you will never go to zero. This is, you will be bigger than zero. So this is a converse because we cannot drive the Rini divergence to zero, the normalized Rini divergence. Okay, so the normalized Rini divergence cannot vanish. So we are done, okay? Now for the strong, so basically, if you don't follow the proof, it's okay. But in the weaker case, say T0.5 equals to T tilde 0.5. This is the common information when we use the Rennie divergence of order 0.5. This is equal to C now. This is the result. The proof, you can absorb some elements and just jettison some elements, I don't care. But this is the main message here that if you use a smaller order, it is robust, okay? So now, what about the stronger case? The stronger case is actually what we are interested in, all right? The, the weaker case is actually a side show. So for the stronger case, we are interested in say T1.5, all right? Then we know that the common information in the Rennie style, all right, is going to be at least as large as Weiner, which is T1, all right? So we will only discuss the case of infinity in this tutorial. For the case, for the other cases, Please refer to our monograph or our papers. For the other cases, as I said, we do not talk about it. But I will talk about some interesting elements of the other cases. The other cases require some somewhat obscure definitions, but I'm going to give you intuition about these. So we are going to talk about the maximal cross entropy. Note what is the cross entropy. The cross entropy is nothing but sum of, say, pi xy, xy, that is log of one over pi xy, xy here. That is the cross entropy. So now I'm going to replace this guy here with an arbitrary joint probability measure here. Okay, arbitrary. But we are going to maximize over all possible joint distributions that are couplings. Now there are couplings of p and px and py. Okay, so this is a very strange notion. Why would anyone care about this? Okay. But it turns out to be useful in the, sub, in the sequel, all right? There are some properties that don't really concern us. But what is the intuition for this uh, quantity? Now, let us take a sequence of n types, Txn, Tyn. So these are types on some alphabet with denominator n. And let these types converge in the usual sense on some total variation sense to Px, Py respectively. Then let us ask the question, what is the minimum pi x, y, n probability of x, n, y, n that have these types, okay, which is this quantity here. So what are we doing? All right. We are taking two sequences of two fixed types. Those types are approximately p, x, p, y respectively. Now I'm measuring, I'm measuring using this joint distribution, 
the probability of x n y n, but I'm allowing the joint type here to vary. The marginal types must be fixed. The, the joint type is allowed to vary in some set. Okay, it turns out that the if you perform some type gymnastics that are uh, we are at least myself, I'm very familiar with, you massage this, you will get that the exponent here is exactly the maximal cross entropy. Okay. So this quantity turns out to be exponential decay of the probability, all right? So why do we care? This allows us to define two notions that you don't need to memorize. You don't need to know. You just need to observe that they are single letter, okay? So these are single letter quantities. Why is single letter? Why is single letter so good? Because we can use a computer to evaluate these quantities, all right? If it's multi-letter, we cannot. So let's define the upper pseudo common information and the lower pseudo common information as these quantities. Okay, sorry, this is not quite, I don't mean this, okay? So basically this part is the same as this for the minus common information. It is just that this part here is allowed to vary. All right, you notice that this is not the same as this, but these two are the same. So they look very much like minus common information, but they are not quite, all right? Because here I allow for optimization over couplings. Now, these two also look different here. This one looks different from this, okay? But this is the same as that. So you notice that there are some similarities between these quantities and minus common information, but they are not quite, all right? Nevertheless, I just alert you to the fact that these are single letter. And by single letter, this allows us to put bounds on the order infinity running common information. So these are this is the uh, unnormalized, all the infinity running common information, and this is the normalized version. And they are basically lower bounded by the lower pseudo common information, lower pseudo common information. And for the upper bound case, they are upper bounded by the upper pseudo common information. So you don't need to worry about these because these are just single letter. But the main idea that we use to prove this in the achievability part is based on random coding, really soft covering, and the truncated product distributions. What is truncated product distribution? You have a product distribution like this, say, okay? If you, if in the Gaussian case, you take code words randomly from IID Gaussian, you will get this pattern here. They will be very close to the correct radius, but then there will be some in and some out. Some violate the power constraint, okay? So what we are gonna do is we don't like code words that are too atypical, so we just kill them, all right? So we just restrict ourselves to some set that is beautiful. Why do we do this? We do this because we can still retain the product structure here. And this is very beautiful for us to apply the method of types. If this set here is big enough, if this set S here is big enough, then we are in business because the normalization, normalization constant here, this mu here, is not going to be too small, okay? So that's the main idea. Truncated product distribution is not our idea. This goes back to Gallagher, all right? In his book, chapter seven. Anyway, so for the rest of the orders, we can obtain similar bounds. We are not going to go through that. But for the DSPS, the discrete, the doubly symmetric binary source, so that is this source here with a crossover probability. Uh, I don't know what crossover probability this is for the source, but you see something from this picture here. Here I plot the order from 0, 1 to 2. From 0 to 1, we are robust, right? The order does not change the really common information. But when I change the order from one to two, then it seems that the common information is going up. Okay, it seems. And this is not because my MATLAB skills are bad, because this is significant, all right? This is not MATLAB error. Okay, so it seems that this is going up, all right? We can evaluate the single letter expressions, but the single letter expressions are not so easy to evaluate because one of them has no cardinality bound, if you recall, I mean, of course, cardinality bound. There's an infima here, so we need a cardinality bound, all right? This has no cardinality bound, so we cannot really do it, but nevertheless, we can increase the cardinality from say two to 10 and 100 and so on. But we, it seems like numerically, the lower bound and the upper bound coincide from numerically. So this gives us evidence that, in fact, the really common information is sensitive to the order once the order is bigger than one. So what I've just said here is that the running common information for the DSBS seems to increase with the order if the order is bigger than one. Does this have more profound implications? 
does this have implications beyond just doing math for the sake of doing math? We will discuss this in the second part. Okay, the second part is on exact common information. So hi Won, I have finished the first part. I am happy to take questions if there are any. Yes, uh, for uh, the attendees, if you have any questions, yeah, you can ask in person to Vincent or, or you can just use the chatting window. Maybe it's very obscure. So uh, during people are thinking of any questions, I have some questions to you about uh, your material. So I wonder, uh, not in terms of just numerical simulations, uh, how, how much the upper and lower bound can be different for some extreme cases uh, from the Rennie common information for S from one to two? Um, okay, now, to evaluate this, this is a very good question. So the question is, how is there any gap between the upper and lower bounds? Right. All right. The upper bound. Okay. Let me let me say let me answer a different question. My different question I want to answer is the following. All right. The upper bound you can restrict the cardinality of W to be less than x y because of this sort of relation here and uh, this sort of thing here. Uh, this is some standard netbook information theory that you are better than me. Okay, so you, you can restrict the alphabet of W. But for the lower bound, we cannot. We cannot mm -hmm. restrict. We don't, know, we don't know how to do it. Okay, so now when we evaluate these sort of things for particular sources, we exploit the symmetry of the sources in a very significant way. The sources like the DSBS has a lot of symmetry. And we know what is the optimal Markov chain when we minimize, especially for minus common information. So we take minus common information, optimal Markov chain as a inspiration to evaluate these guys here. So because we have the optimal Markov chain that is given to us by Weiner, we have a good starting point. If you use some other, if you consider some other source, then I'm sorry, but you don't even know what is the optimal Markov chain to start to evaluate these things. So while I say that these are single letter, okay. I'm actually cheating a little bit. Because if, I, if you just give me a 10 by 10 source, there's no way of evaluating this unless you just do brute force optimization. These are not convex. Yeah. So the answer to your question is, if the source has nice symmetry, like the discrete or the doubly symmetric binary source, yes, we have hope. But uh, we, see, we see that uh, there is very little gap, if there is any at all. So the upper and lower bounds match for the doubly symmetric binary source. And we will analytically prove that uh, for the case of plus infinity, okay, like this case here, they exactly match analytically. But for the intermediate cases, we only have numerical calculations. Yeah, at best. And you still expect such increasing trend for NES Yes, and yes, it's yes. larger than zero. Yes, yes, we expect, but we have only proved, uh, we only have analytical calculations up to two. I see. Yes. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions from the audience? So many. Uh, so yeah, people can use the 10 minute break to think okay. of any questions uh, to okay. let you know. And, and yeah, so we will uh, resume our session at 2.30. Okay, great. Thank you. Great, thanks.